Thank you very much, uh, Philip. It's a real pleasure uh, to be here. So I got three things to say before I start my talk. To begin with, thank you very much for organizing this. This is really, really cool. Uh, I've seen the people from the previous two days working really hard for many, many years of getting people excited about this. And it must feel quite good looking back at this crowd, seeing all of you being interested in this really exciting things. And I'm super excited about that myself. Secondly, I want to say I'm quite humbled to being invited to present here because, to be honest, I don't really do probabilistic numerics. So why am I then talking here today? Well, what I would say is the probabilistic numerics have really changed the way I think about problems fundamentally. So part of what I'm going to do during this talk is that I'm going to give a little bit of a story and a little bit of a philosophy of how this has helped me reason about things and how it really motivates and influences the work that I do. And the last part that I wanted to say is that John said very nicely, if you give the first talk at the workshop, then you can kind of say a little bit what you want. If you give the third talk, if it's a really, really good workshop, you come here on Sunday and you have a finished talk and you say, great, now I'm just going to enjoy the workshop. It's a really good one. You end up learning lots of things, and the person that you are on the Wednesday is not the same as you were on the Monday. So that means you sit up all night and you change all your slides because you realize there's lots of things that you need to say and you need to comment about. And that also means that I should say sorry to those speakers previously that I'm going to quote, probably misquote, I'm going to misuse your notation, I'm going to say things that I thought you meant that you probably didn't mean at all. Great. So to begin with that, I'm going to refer to Philip's talk in the beginning, which was a very exciting talk. And he was very excited about probabilistic numerics and machine learning as a whole, right? We're going through a big transition as the machine learning community. We are actually seeing things actually working, and we have a huge uh, impact on the world. And this is really, really exciting. And among all these things that one should then start choosing of what to work on, I would then say that probabilistic numerics is the sliced bread of machine learning at the moment, right? And partly, a lot of the advances that we've done have come from empirical stuff that we've done, right? But actually, I think what probabilistic numerics is trying to do is trying to derive or write up a narrative around these things. Because a lot of the things that's already been said during the workshop are actually the things that makes these crazy big models actually work. So what's important with a narrative? A narrative is important because it allows you to make attribution correctly. And if we can do attribution as a scientific community, then we can figure out what we should actually work on. And that's the really important thing. OK, so the next thing I'm going to steal is this slide from John, because I'm now going to start telling my story. So John showed this really nice slide with the crystal ball. So when I started doing machine learning, this was exactly how my world looked like, and I believed in this crystal ball. So I was on the left-hand side of this thing. The task for me was to learn everything about statistical models and distributions and stochastical processes and all this. And then I was supposed to find a problem, go out and talk to the domain experts that generated the data, build this very swanky model, and then the decision process, the prediction, the inference, that just happens, right? Cool. Very, very good. And next to me in my lab where I did my PhD, there was all these people working on mark of random fields on images. And I sat on my high horse and made fun of them because I said, cool, so you're segmenting an image. Have you tried sampling from your POTS model? Oh, does that look anything like the image that you want? And I said, you can't do this. This is silly. Why did they do that? Well, they did that because they thought of computation and model at the same time because they picked their models that they could do graph cuts and all sorts of convex stuff on them, right? They thought about the model and what they could solve at the same time. I didn't because I thought that was silly. So if you go on to furthering my high horse, I pretty much said that what I'm actually doing is that I'm implementing the scientific principle, right? Okay, so 
This is even mentioned in the book in some sense, where it uses the word hygiene. The Bayesian norm enforces hygiene between modeling and decision making. So then I continued on working, and I realized that a lot of the time I had to do all these dirty tricks to solve things. I had to sit and spend all this time doing initialization. I picked weird sorts of gradient-based algorithms. I did all sorts of annealing schemes and all this stuff. And it was just that dirty stuff that I needed to do. But I still had my ideology set. And then the field, if you look at it, made all sorts of cool advances. Here are two of them. On the left, it's a VAE. And a VAE is very confusing. It's already been mentioned. It's a really, really confusing thing because it's very hard to say when model and inference starts and stops, right? I would even go to the extent of saying it's a rubbish model that no one ever wants to use and no one ever wants to have, but it's a really useful inference scheme in that model that gives you a solution that's useful. That then led to diffusion models if you recurse these things and all sorts of cool stuff. Go on the left-hand side, you got things like stochastic gradient descent. People who do stochastic gradient descent in a neural network, this has nothing to do with getting a good statistical estimate of the true gradient. It has that you want to have a bad one so that you find these local minimas, that you, these flat local minimas that you really want, right? So all these weird things happen, and I kind of had to admit to myself that my hygiene wasn't particularly good, right? So I said to myself, I'm effectively a pragmatic Bayesian, right? Okay, and I was okay with that. 90% of my time was spent doing these weird things after I understood the statistical models. Okay, so continue on the story. In NeurIPS, I wasn't called that then, 2014, I bump into Philip, and he's very, very excited about this Runge Kutta paper that you had at that point. And Philip really wants to explain this to me, and I just didn't get it. I think I was nodding at the right time, so saying like, ooh, and my ass, where I should be, so he felt okay, but I just didn't get it. Why would you ever want to do this? But then I kind of said like, okay, but I kind of need to try and understand this. So I tried to follow this, and here's a couple of really, really, to me, three papers that I found incredibly important for me to continue understanding this. So I kept reading this, and what I kind of realized that what I needed to do in order to continue understanding this thing, we used to raise my view of ideology a little bit. Because all the things that I saw as hacks, I could actually think of with the same mechanisms as I thought of my modeling part. And in some ways, I usually use this slide when I explain to people why you should do Bayesian machine learning, where I take a step into statistical learning theory and if you think about the three points, three inputs that you have to any learning algorithm, you've got your data set, you've got your algorithm, and you've got your hypothesis space, right? Your hypothesis class. All I spent working on and thinking about a probabilistic manner was my hypothesis space. And what effectively probabilistic numerics allows you to do, this thinking about it, allows you to think about also your algorithm and how you acquire your data set in the same manner. So by just raising your bar, you can keep your ideolo ideology, and that made me really happy. So in some ways, I then, instead of feeling like an unhygienic pig, I felt like a king or a queen veltering around in this mud. So what I'm now going to try to do is to try and next abuse Tim Sullivan's beautiful visual notation and I'm going to try and explain not just what I think probabilistic numerics is, but also explain what I effectively think machine learning is. So we have this notion here, which I'm just going to go through what was said yesterday, where I have some form of latent quantity. In this case, it's some joint distribution of something. And then I have some form of quantity of interest that I'm interested in, and I have an operation that goes from one to the other. So we can say, if we do use classical simple machine learning, that I got a joint distribution, and what I'm interested in doing some predictions, so I want a conditional distribution as a quantity of interest. Now that's not really machine learning. What you do as a machine learner is that you now have some samples 
of that joint distribution, and you try to design some other operator that takes you to this quantity of interest. And then the Bayesian view of this will be to say what I'm supposed to do is that I'm supposed to design some form of mechanism so that I try to learn, I try to mimic this joint distribution so that I can use the same operation to go from that approximation or that model that I have down to that quantity of interest. That's the notion, right? Okay, so then in the early days, we kind of talked about if you're on the side where you try to say, I'm going to model everything in the world. So I'm going to try and understand the world because that allows me to input all the prior knowledge that I have. I'm on the straight line that goes there. And then you had another school of thought, which we refer to as people who do discriminative models. They said, well, actually, I don't care about modeling anything. I'm just going to describe the decision straight away. Okay? So that's kind of how I separated the world at one point of time. But then, to quote another thing from this great book, modeling or inference used to be thought of as a passive mathematical map from data to estimates. But machine learning often views a model as an agent in an autonomous interaction with its environment, most explicitly in reinforcement learning. This view of algorithms as agents as above is very central to probabilistic numerics. So in that sense, we also need to add this axis here. We need to add this operation where we say, I actually have some control over the data set that I decide to learn my model on. So the thing I'm going to talk about today is Bayesian optimization. So I tried to put Bayesian optimization into this schematic graph where effectively I have some function, which is now unknown to me, which is my latent quantity, and I try to find the minima of this thing. And now, as Roman very nicely explained, what I have is that I got this information operator, this operation that says, where should I query, which is my acquisition function. I get this data set, and then I try to model this function. And when I model this function, this feeds back and I make decisions of where I should query the function back, um, uh, that model feeds back up to the acquisition function. So now, just as a side note, for those of you who've heard this argument, is Bayesian optimization probabilistic numerics? I would argue no. And the reason why it's no is that we do not model this thing. We do not write down a model of the quantity of interest what we're effectively doing is that we're just modeling the function, even though I do not actually care about the function, right? What we'll see is that in my talk, I'll try and nudge these things a little bit to see of maybe how we can, what we should do to actually think about Bayesian optimization as a probabilistic numerics algorithm. So, now there's another quote in the book that comes uh, from a discussion of saying, is probabilistic numerics a Bayesian or a frequentist approach? And there's some, there's some fussiness about this. So it says this, this can be conceived as letting some loss function on computation dictate what elements of the prior that can be incorporated. What I like to think about this is go back to this graph. So if you don't add the agent operation, if you don't have control over the environment of what you should query in the world to learn from, this separation of discrimination and generative models is very clear to me. If you have a fixed data set, you should put in as much prior information as you humanly can about it. But if you're in control over the data that you have, now you start questioning, why should I actually model the whole world if I actually have a specific quantity of interest that I should include? And now that means that this boundary of all these bent lines that lies in somewhere, somewhere of what we're working on is kind of like some continuous space between these things. Sometimes we really model everything, like we do in a Bayesian optimization setting. We really try to model the function, and then we do this. But you can also start thinking, maybe if my loss function that comes from the quantity of interest dictates there's these things in the prior, 
that I should use that are relevant for me, then maybe I should focus my modeling there. So there's a further quote on this. In considering an additional computational cost on a model, we must consider whether it's justified in improving performance for the given numerical task. This performance is measured by the loss function. So this was kind of what I tried to say. Actually, if you know what you're going to do, maybe you can do this in a more beneficial way. So now, why is this important? It's important that because we always have model mismatch. So there's a thing I just like to bring up. We've seen a lot of Gaussian processes. A lot of us comes from a Gaussian process background. Gaussian processes are great. They're really cool. But one thing I think is often misunderstood is that we say they're incredibly flexible models. They're not. They're the least flexible model that I know, and that's why I use them. Right? Why can they learn from small amounts of data? Because I can specify an incredibly narrow prior. It's just the notion that we look at these prior samples, and in our parametric head, we think, wow, look at all these functions. If I had to write down the function class that contained all of these, that would have to be really big. But that's just because you think parametrically, all of these functions look qualitatively exactly the same. Right? So a GP is good because it's a very, very narrow prior. It's a prior that has support everywhere, but what that means, if I want to learn efficiently, right, I need a lot of data to move this prior. And now, because we always have model mismatch, then it becomes quite interesting to take in this notion of what the loss function over the quantity of interest can allow me to do. So let me then just give you an example of this. So effectively, what my loss function does, so this is a quadrature thing that I've written up here. What my loss function effectively does is that it gives me an equivalence class. It gives me an equivalence class of things that are equal, right? So in the example of integration, actually my algorithm that I implement just has to work on any function that has the same integral as the one that I'm looking for, right? I'm trying to integrate a function. I only care about the integral. I don't need to know the function. Every function that has the same integral is equivalent, right? So now, for those of you who know as I've how I've generated this plot, you're probably going to see that I'm not telling the full story here. But what I've done here is that I've taken the simple um, O'Hagan Bayesian quadrature thingy, and what I've just written up is that I've written up the posterior, or the predictive GP posterior, that I've conditioned on the integral. So in this case here, I've got a set of functions. This is over a Gaussian measure. And I've set the integral to some value. Now I can alter the integral. The only thing I've altered is the integral. And now all of these functions are equivalent. So what I'm trying to say is, if I'm trying to solve a numerical task, Actually, it doesn't matter which one of all these functions that I pick and decide to learn, they're all equivalent, right? Can we exploit this? Because there's certain things, the things in my prior model that I would do really well on, that my agent will work really well on, could I then focus on those things instead, right? Cool. So what I'm going to do today uh, is that now I'm going to go quite quickly because hopefully if setting this up properly you're just going to find that this is quite simple. I'm going to tell you about how we can do this or how this motivated thinking about the problem in this way some work in Bayesian optimization where we're effectively saying trying to balance the fact that I have certain functions which is really easy to search over and then I have the actual function. And we try to balance these two things together. So the work here is really all the good stuff has been done by Eric and Neil. And all the bad stuff that's confusing, I take full responsibility for. So what we're then going to do, we're going to acknowledge that we always have model mismatch. If I have the right model, it doesn't matter. right? So I have model mismatch. My uncertainties, the most important part of the uncertainties, 
because I'm not building a model of the quantity of interest, is to inform the agent of where we should go and search further in space. We only care about no understanding or learning about the latent variable up to the equivalence class defined by the quantity of interest. I only care about finding the minima. I don't actually care about learning the function. The function is only interesting to learn to the level which it informs me of the quantity of interest. And we can't specify a model over this directly. So what we're going to think about instead then is that we're going to rethink the way we put the prior in. And we're going to think about the prior as a structure over the function that gives me the most efficient search. I'm going to think about the prior in a classical GP prior sense. I'm not going to think about the prior just as something that says how much does the function vary between two locations. I'm going to think about how informative is the distance between two points in location for informing me about the minima. I want to explain away the variance that's not helpful for me to solve the task. So I want somehow a model that can accommodate this. And then I want to say that all information are not equally informative over the extremum that I'm looking for. And the information content changes over time, importantly. And yeah, this is kind of what I said on the previous slide, but the uncertainty about the function is only a weak proxy for our ignorance about the minima. So an example of this is this. This here is a function that I'm going to use throughout. It's not the function with noise. Clearly, it's incredibly heavily designed to show exactly my point. But that's kind of the point of making images for slides, right? So what I'm trying to show here is that if I want to learn this function to find this minima, currently I've seen these points. That's the GP that I've currently fitted to this. It do things that it has a very small length scale. I only have one length scale here, remember, model mismatch. And then it says that I should query somewhere very close <coughs> to the lowest point that I've seen so far. Well, my argument here is that this point here, the thing that really destroys this issue is this point here. If I had not seen this point at this point of time, this function would fit, be able to fit this with a much smoother length scale. So knowing this point at this time is actually detrimental for me in order to search for the minima. It becomes detrimental for the agent itself right, at this point. So what we're going to do to rectify this is that we're going to model not the function itself. We're going to try and have a function model that can balance the prior that I put in. And you remember how I said I reinterpret the prior slightly with the data. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to, my function is f. I'm going to model that using a function called g where I'm going to add a latent variable to. In this case, in all examples that I'm going to show, I'm just going to use a one-dimensional latent variable. And then I'm going to say that this latent variable is itself is just an independent Gaussian. So there's no correlation between in the prior for where the location of this Gaussian variable is. Okay? So the idea of that you can think of very simply as this. So let's say I want to model this function, right? And I have model mismatch. I have a homo, um, I have a homo scedastic uh, <coughs> covariance function that says there's one length scale in this. There isn't one length scale in this. But what I can do if I add a latent variable, so I add a dimension to it, I can allow my model now to say, OK, cool, if you put these points, if you put the z-axis in this case and make it an exponential, cool, this is just the sine function. I can fit this perfectly. So I'm effectively giving the freedom to the model to say, wow, you can use this variable with some cost, and you can fit the prior pretty much exactly. You're allowed to reshuffle the data in some way, right? Another example would be, let's say I see 
this function here, and now I've specified a specific covariance structure on this, I can move these points instead, and I can say, cool, I can fit exactly uh, this shape to it instead, okay? So the notion here is that I have, because I got this prior on this thing, there's a penalty associated with altering the data, right? It's a penalty to say, I really, really just want to fit the prior. And there's another penalty from the GP prior to says, oh, this data doesn't really fit my prior, right? So these two things tugs and pulls with each other, okay? So, what do you then do with a random variable, right? Well, we all know this. You integrate out the random variable, right? So when I want the predictive posterior, the acquisition function searches over x, right? It doesn't know anything about age. It can't sample in age. Age doesn't exist. So what should I do, right? I just marginalize it out, right? So think what marginalization means. You can think about this surface that I've now fitted. That looks like this. Marginalization just slaps that surface together, right? So if I do that, and let's go back to the example that I have, I will get something like this. Yeah? Okay? Eh, I'm not super happy about this, right? Because what I'm doing now is that I'm including this variance that I effectively said that I wanted to explain away. So what I'm going to do instead, I'm going to do something that potentially is slightly odd, but I'm going to take and infer the h, so I'm going to derive the posterior over h of all the points that I have, so I'm giving an h to every data point, but then when I do the predictive posterior, I'm always going to look at slice zero. I'm always going to, so that basically means that I explain away that variance of the things that have been moved out. So if you compare that, it's going to look something like this instead. So what you have in this location here, I've got lots of data, right? Why is there so small variance here? It's because it's moved all these points really far out, and it's managed to fit this plane really, really nicely through that with a very long length scale. So the length scale is actually really long, and then I collapse this thing. It's effectively then saying, cool, now these points have a very small contribution to um, the variance here, okay? So if in that case I get a much more sensible of what I thought was sensible acquisition function that now says you should go out and explore here. So that acquisition now, or the agent here, if you think again back to what I said my prior is, I have this penalty for going away from the prior and my prior then effectively says, what is the structures that I can search over really efficiently? Cool. So just to give you an idea of there's this variance parameter of h, right? So on these plots, what I have here is that the red bar is just showing the scale of the variance in h. If I make it tiny, well, nothing matters, right? It's just going to get zero of all of them and I get just the normal GP fit. If I make it really, really big, it just completely ignores all the data. Everything gets a really large H. And somewhere in between, you can see the different types of structures that are now being explained away. Great, so I'm gonna try and wrap up. I'm already over time, sorry about this. But what you do if you do base opt, is that you have to run all these ridiculously silly functions that people have decided are somehow informative. We have these quantitative data sets. I've never ever seen a physical system, I think, that looks something like this. But apparently these are important, and this is some form of legacy of people who designed numerical algorithms for optimization back in the days. Uh, so we still have to run all of these. And now I'm going to super quickly show you a very long list, and you can expect what there's lots of bold numbers that are associated with what I'm proposing. So I'm showing you that quickly, okay? Because it's utterly uninteresting to show those things. I find it, but it's something that you have to do to publish papers. What I want to show you instead is this specific example. 
So this here is one of these functions, the hold the table. And here I have lots of runs of different algorithms that have been done. The black one here is R. It's lower because I published this paper, right? I'm sure if one of those is your other algorithm, you can make it that one better, right? This is just what we do, right? When we welter around in the mud, yeah? And you see a variance here, which is the really, really important thing. If you ever review a BO paper and they don't show variance, it's an instant reject, because if you apply this in practice, that's the thing you care about, okay? So this all looks nice. I would say they're all equally good. Now look at the plot on the left. I'm gonna slightly alter this function, but I'm gonna alter it not by noise, but by a deterministic function that has a completely different length scale. I'm doing this, right? Okay, let's do this. It's not a huge difference. However, this here has now an enormous difference, right? You see how much the variance of some of these other runs changes. And the reason for that is that you do random restarts, and sometimes your acquisition function is gonna get some bad data. It's bad because this really doesn't fit your prior, so your search become uninformative. And you have no way to exclude data points because you still have to model them, and you're really trying to model the function here. Right? You're not trying to model the quantity of interest. It has a huge impact. And then your acquisition function might pick something bad. And of course, in a Bayesian setting, eventually you will overcome this data point, but you're going to have to query a lot of data for doing that. Now, what we can see, which we're really happy about, is that we're much less susceptible to this. The black thing here, even though you can also see it doesn't do the best thing always, because we're effectively oversmoothing the data, right? We're not modeling the function, and if you really get the right points, you're gonna do the right thing, if you actually have not model mismatch in that setting. But we have a very, very small variance, and this is something which we're really happy with. And in applications, this is the thing that matters. If you actually go out to someone who actually does this, they don't wanna run this 5,000 times. So, I'm gonna conclude with this, and you say, one thing that I think is really nice is use this notion of including the loss function as a part or the inference or the optimization or all this computational stuff as a part of your model and thinking about this jointly is not dirty. It's a good thing, right? And I think probabilistic numerics allows us to think about these things in a good manner. The big question here in this talk is that what is this prior? It's not really a prior of the function, it's a mixed form of prior between the function and what I want to search over. Now, this debate then if BO is more is probabilistic numerics or not, I think in the classical sense of quadrature, which falls so beautifully into this framework, where we just write up this model and it's super nice and we're just being Bayesian and it fits our thinking so well, it's not. Maybe BO has a lot more to do with the bookkeeping notion of linear algebra, right? We think what was the relevant things that I've captured, what are the things that I need to remember for the next stage in order to do this efficiently. Importantly, in order to think about BO, this notion of model mismatch, like thinking about what acquisition function you use, blah, 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 all of these things, I think is utterly interest, uninteresting if you've got the right model. It doesn't matter. The acquisition function is there in some non-parametric hack to force you to model the relevant things. That's at least how I think about this. This work probably isn't probabilistic numerics either, but the thinking of it that I try to allude to is definitely inspired by this. Then I just wanted to leave you with one final comment that I think really fits this workshop that a colleague and friend of mine usually says. I'm not sure if I should attribute it to him because probably someone else said it as well. 
But Neil Lawrence usually says this, which I think is really beautiful in the setting of what Philip started talking about. What we've been doing is merging the notion of computation and data, seeing them as equal partners. And Neil says the Big Bang started, and it started doing lots of computation. Data is effectively computations that the universe has already done for us. Right? And the balance here is to start thinking about what should I compute and what should I use that's already been computed. And with that, I'm going to finish a little bit over time. Sorry about this. <laughs>